Ebola Offensive, America pledges to stop the deadly disease at its source. ISIS strategy, the military's top brass on Capitol Hill explaining its plan of attack. Family planning, Philadelphia's Archbishop shares his vision for next year's World Meeting of Families. And football brides, fall weddings planned around the big game. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Tuesday, September 16th, 2014. Good evening from Washington. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick with your news now. Tonight, the U.S. steps up its response to the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. President Obama is preparing to send 3,000 U.S. military personnel to that region. They'll train health care workers and set up clinics. This announcement comes as victims of that epidemic testify before Congress. Jason Calvi is on Capitol Hill with more. Brian, Ebola has hit Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea the hardest. So far, at least 2,400 people have died from it. And today, lawmakers here heard from experts, including one survivor. Dr. Kent Brantley contracted Ebola while working as a missionary in Liberia. He was flown back to the U.S. for treatment and recovered. He says his medical care and prayer saved him. I think that's very much a miracle that all of those pieces came together, and I give God the glory for my healing. He's just one of a number of people sharing their experience and expertise with the Senate panel today. Ishmael Charles is fighting the spread of Ebola in his native Sierra Leone, where he says more than 400 have died. In his view, the disease is impacting the economy. Farmers are dying, and the farms are there. The, 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 no one is there to do the harvest. People are losing their job. Workers are losing their job on a daily basis. Banks are, are losing so much economy. The, 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 the hotels and, and, and caterings or restaurants are closing on a daily basis. Charles is working with the Healy Foundation, an American nonprofit. They're teaching people about good hygiene and how to minimize risk. The Catholic organization Caritas is also on the front lines of the battle in Sierra Leone's capital. Part of their work and is then, to find uh, homes for orphans board. left behind. Because, you know, they are stigmatized. A normal family will not want them in because they feel they will pass on the virus. Father Peter says the Ebola outbreak is affecting everybody, not just the sick. In Sierra Leone, the government is ordering people to stay home this weekend. So the church there is encouraging people to listen to Mass on the radio this Sunday. And now that he's well, Dr. Brantley has an urgent message for Congress and the president. I hope that the United States government takes immediate action on the, the commitments and promises that have been made because we cannot afford delay uh, in, our, in our response. We've already delayed too long and we need to take action now. And we're just learning that Dr. Brantley and his wife Amber were able to take that message directly to the president at the White House today. And in Atlanta, the president said the Ebola crisis is a possible global security threat. He says if we don't stop it now, that hundreds of thousands of people could be affected. Here at the Capitol, Jason Calvi, EWTN News Nightly. Some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. The Taliban claims responsibility for a suicide bombing that killed three foreign troops and wounded nearly 20 soldiers and civilians in Afghanistan. This attack happened on a busy road in Kabul near the U.S. Embassy. It rattled nearby neighborhoods. Security forces gave CPR to the wounded. The blast comes as the U.S. and NATO prepare to withdraw forces by the end of the year. With these deaths, 59 international troops have been killed in Afghanistan this year. At least 42 of them were Americans. A warning to Congress from the military's top brass. If ISIS is not stopped, it will threaten our homeland. Wyatt Goolsby joins us now with the latest. Yeah, Brian, a key part of President Obama's strategy in fighting the terrorist group ISIS has been a promise of no American boots on the ground in Iraq or Syria. But during a congressional hearing today, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff says if the situation gets bad enough, he will recommend sending in ground troops. My view at this point is that this coalition is the appropriate way forward. I believe that will prove true. But if it fails to be true, and if there are threats to the United States, then I, of course, would go back to the president and make a recommendation that may include the use of U.S. military ground forces. 
A possible mixed message today from General Martin Dempsey with the country's approach to tackling ISIS. Dempsey was on Capitol Hill alongside Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel answering questions about President Obama's strategy of air campaigns and training Syrian rebels, all the while trying to satisfy lawmakers about how U.S. forces will be used. Are the pilots dropping bombs in Iraq, as they're now doing, a direct combat uh, mission? And secondly, will U.S. forces be prepared to provide combat search and rescue if a pilot gets shot down? And will they put boots on the ground to make that uh, rescue successful? Yes and yes. The confusion about whether troops in Iraq are actually combat forces prompted a White House response, reiterating the president isn't deploying the military in direct combat roles. The U.S. has expanded its airstrike offensive against ISIS over the past week and is working to build a coalition of nations to contribute to a military effort. Lawmakers are preparing to vote tomorrow whether or not to train Syrian rebels, but some doubt that plan will do enough. Well, we've got to do more uh, than uh, train a few folks in Syria uh, and train a few folks in Iraq and dropping bombs. I just don't know that it's enough to achieve the objective the president outlined. The president will be meeting with military leaders in Florida tomorrow where U.S. operations in the Middle East are planned. Brian. Thank you, Wyatt. There are new questions tonight about the Affordable Care Act and abortion funding. The Government Accountability Office surveyed insurers about whether they have plans that provide abortion services separate from those that don't, and if they keep the two funds between the two types of plans separate. In a new report, of 18 insurers the GAO reviewed, only one kept funds separate or itemized charges that cover elective abortions. That means taxpayer dollars are being used to pay for abortions. In order to pass Obamacare, the president promised pro-life Democrats that no federal funds would be used for elective abortions. This report also finds most insurers were unaware that they're required to notify policyholders if they cover elective abortions. Marjorie Dannenfelser is president of Susan B. Anthony List, a group that seeks to advance pro-life policies. Marjorie, is this an oversight on the part of the insurance companies? Well, it's primarily the responsibility of the Obama administration that has executive authority and making sure that this law is obeyed. Uh, if the insurance companies don't know how to do it, well, then they haven't been told how to do it. But there's one thing for sure. They don't feel any obligation to do it whatsoever uh, because what is happening is full taxpayer funding of abortion for over a 1,000 uh, plans right now. And we will see up to 6.1 million women covered for this unless there is some kind of fix. Remind us of the Hyde Amendment and how it might apply here. Sure. The Hyde Amendment covers just Medicaid, but a Hyde type amendment was the idea uh, right before this bill was passed, and it was a Stupak uh, Smith amendment that would have applied to the entire health care bill. Well, it was not passed, and therefore we're seeing the consequences of that now. And that's what that promise to all those pro life Democrats uh, led to. Uh, it led to that statute not getting fixed, and now it leads to the problem that we're seeing right now, and it's making all of us culpable. It's why it was the last point of contention before the bill was passed and why the Catholic bishops were so concerned that this be fixed so that we wouldn't be sitting where we are now talking about this GAO report. Some people say though we're making a big deal out of nothing. The report says the figures really average out to just a few cents a month. Is this worth the battle? Wow. I mean, if we could just roll back the tape just a little bit, when we were fighting about this on the floor of the House of Representatives, when it was passed and when we talked about this nonstop at that time, what we said was going to be true is true. You and I and everyone watching here is subsidizing abortions, something that we know is the killing of an unborn child, something our faith says is wrong and reason says is wrong. To give one penny to, is, makes us complicit in each and every act. We're looking at potentially 6.1 million women being covered for abortion, and you and I will be complicit in that with our money. So is the funding compromise confusing even for insurers here? Sure, it's confusing, and frankly, the confusion has led to lack of uh, resilience in terms of fixing the problem. Uh, it is not everything in this health care bill is complicated, including this. But there's one thing that is very clear. The government used to not manage abortion in health care. Now it does. They promised some separate gimmick that would keep our money out of it. They didn't do it. Nobody knows going into the exchanges whether their abortion 
uh, coverage is in their plan or not. So there is no transparency. All the promises after four and a half years are still not fulfilled. The fix is to fix this in the U.S. Senate. But first, there's going to have to be a different U.S. Senate. This will be an enormous issue in this coming uh, November election uh, and electing a new Senate that would pass something like this. All right. From the Susan B. Anthony list, Marjorie Dannenfelser, great to have you back with us today. Thanks, as always. Thank you. Well, Bobby Jindal won't say that he's running yet, but the Louisiana governor is sounding a lot like a presidential candidate today. Speaking in Washington, he laid out a plan to boost the nation's energy production. He says the White House has become science deniers by not fully tapping into domestic energy resources. Jindal also says the president should exercise more steady leadership domestically and on the world stage. America plays a critical role and America must provide leadership. A stronger America leads to peace in the world. That's not just a slogan, that's truth. This president does not seem to understand that. Ironically, a stronger, more predictable America leads to fewer deployments of American troops overseas. At a separate event, Jindal said he would make a decision about running for president after the November election. Well, today marks one year since the Washington Navy Yard shooting. Victims were honored during a private ceremony near the Navy Yard this morning. A bell tolled as the names of those who died were read aloud. Defense contractor and former Navy reservist Aaron Alexis carried out his rampage a year ago, killing 12, wounding three others. The Navy's top commander spoke at the ceremony about moving forward. We come together to remember our shipmates who were lost in the service of their nation and their Navy. We rededicate ourselves in their memory to miss the mission they so passionately supported as we move forward together. The building where that shooting happened will reopen to Navy personnel next year. Pennsylvania State Police have named a suspect in the shooting that left a state trooper dead and another wounded. They say the Pennsylvania man, 31-year-old Matthew Freen, is armed and extremely dangerous. The, attacker, the attack happened Friday night outside of police barracks in northeastern Pennsylvania. Since then, a manhunt for Freen has involved 200 law enforcement officers. With the busy holiday season approaching, UPS plans to hire up to 95,000 seasonal workers. UPS needs package sorters, loaders, delivery helpers, and drivers. Last year, a last-minute surge in holiday shipments drove up the shipper's costs, hurting its profits. The company says it's spent this year improving its planning. The carrier is adding thousands of vehicles to handle the extra load this year. UPS says seasonal workers often get permanent positions with the company. Coming up, Archbishop Charles Sheffew tells our Alan Holdren he expects Pope Francis to be in Philadelphia next summer. And we talk with a man planning another papal trip to Albania, the homeland of Blessed Mother Teresa. On Tuesday evening, September 16th, this is EWTN News Nightly. I'm Brian Patrick. A new Gaza Strip may soon rise from the rubble of the war-torn Palestinian territory. The United Nations has brokered a reconstruction agreement giving a lead role to the Palestinian Authority. The UN will monitor construction materials to make sure they won't be diverted from civilian to military use. A UN official who visited Gaza last week cites, quote, shocking levels of destruction to infrastructure, hospitals, and schools. He says large neighborhoods have been totally ruined and more than 100 U.N. facilities were damaged. A fragile ceasefire has now held for a month in the region. After celebrating matrimony with 20 couples on Sunday, Pope Francis will now preside at a special mass for grandparents. Francis and 100 elderly priests will celebrate a mass in St. Peter's Square September 28th in honor of the elderly. This is part of the Pope's long-standing belief that older people should be actively cherished for their wisdom. Some 40,000 people from 20 nations are expected to attend the special mass. This mass and Sunday's group wedding are focusing attention on family life ahead of a two-year church study on family issues. Meanwhile, Pope Francis is making a quick but significant trip to Albania this weekend. We're joined on Skype by Albert Nicola from Albania. He's the National Director of Caritas Albania and coordinating the papal visit to Albania September 21st. Tell us a little bit about the excitement there in Albania about this papal visit. 
Well, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, I have to say that, generally speaking, all Albanians are waiting with a great sense of gratitude to the Pope's visit. Uh, basically, the Albanian society look, look at the Pope, at his image, as a kind of hope, as a kind of uh, person that is really bringing to us, bringing to us support in our, in our difficult road to the European Union. For this reason, I am really sure that uh, the Albanian society is very happy of this visit. And uh, everybody could understand it by reading newspaper, by looking at TV, in the social media. So people are really excited to, to wait Pope Francis. Pope Francis is so lovable to, to Albanians. Of course, just a little over 20 years ago, John Paul II visited Albania. Things have changed a great deal in your country since then, haven't they? Well, uh, when Pope uh, John Paul II visited Albania, uh, communism just collapsed. And uh, in that moment, uh, the Albanian society was uh, really shocked by the communist regime. And in that moment, we really were in a dramatic moment of our recent history, and we needed hope. And I remember that moment, I was 20 years old in that time, and uh, I remember that Pope kissed our land at the moment that, that uh, the, the airplane landed. And uh, really, it was just to say to us, Albanians, you are not alone. Pope is here with you. And that's what we needed. And uh, the Catholic Church in that moment uh, really wanted to have a great support because the Catholic community during the communist regime has suffered a lot. And this pope really emphasizes unity between the various world religions. You have the majority Muslim religion there, the Orthodox, and of course, the Catholic faith there. So the choice of Albania is significant for the Holy Father, is it not? Yes, it's really it's, uh, <coughs> it's significant because uh, uh, I think that the Holy Father is really, really involved in the question of dialogue since he was the, the Bishop of Buenos Aires. And for this reason, I think he appreciated a lot the fact that in Albania there is an interreligious dialogue, there is an interreligious coexistence, but this has been a kind of good tradition in Albania since years. So uh, I think that this is a great moment. And in fact, in the program of the Pope's visit, uh, in, is the program, the meeting with the, with the representatives of different religious communities in Albania. And uh, most of them has expressed their gratitude for this meeting. Well, thank you so much for sharing the excitement with us, and we look forward to the Pope's visit. Albert Nicola joining us by Skype from Albania, the National Director of Caritas Albania and Coordinator of the Holy Father's Visit. Thank you again. We appreciate your time spent with us. Thank you very much, and uh, thank, thanks to every American looking at your TV. All right, Pope Francis is expected to be in Philadelphia next year for the World Meeting of Families. Tonight, for a sneak peek at what to expect, we go to Alan Holdren in Rome. Alan? Brian, we're here in Rome with Archbishop Charles Chapu of the Archdiocese of Philadelphia in uh, the United States. He uh, is here to present the catechesis for the, uh, the World Meeting of Families next year. So thank you for being with us, Archbishop. Thank you, Alan. Can I'm you, happy to be here. Can you tell us a little bit more about this catechesis that you've come up with? Well, I've actually brought a copy of the catechism because I thought people would want to see it. Uh, we prepared this in uh, Philadelphia for the world. It's going to be published in six languages. And it's a preparation document for the World Meeting of Families, which takes place in about a year from now. Uh, I think it's a wonderful piece of work. In fact, I would recommend that the, the uh, synod that's going on later this month use this as a preparation document for the next synod. It's very well written, and we're very proud of it. And uh, this is a preparation also for the Synod in a time where uh, people are really talking about um, the, the challenges of the family to the family in the, in the world today. Uh, and this uh, Synod also is a little bit threatened in a sense, it seems like, because there's a lot of media attention that seems to take away the essence of the questions. Will there be any major changes as a result of uh, this Synod? Well, I, I can't predict what's going to happen any more than anybody else can, but uh, the church is always a church, always guided by the Holy Spirit, always protected from error and, and moved towards creativity by the Holy Spirit. So I have great confidence that whatever happens there will be under the guidance of God and we can have confidence in the future. Uh, everything comes to us through the family, every bit of it, from a bit, every bit of our lives, from our genes to um, our ability to deal with problems, uh, how to cooperate with others in society. So I think the Synod is very, very important for the world, not just for the Catholic Church. 
So I'm praying along with everybody else that it be a wonderful experience for, for everyone and that the Holy Spirit is able to change the world through the work of the Synod. And of course the, uh, the Pope will also be taking part in those Synod uh, discussions. Will the Pope be taking part in the World Meeting of Families? We hope so. You know, I've talked to him about it several times and in every situation he's indicated a hope to come. There's no official announcement yet. We expect that to come several months out before the event. But we're working hard and we're expecting him to come and we're making all the preparations necessary for that. All right, well, thank you so much for being with us, Archbishop. Yeah, look forward to seeing you in Philadelphia, September 2015. Thank you. For more information on the World Meeting of Families, including how to register, visit worldmeeting2015.org. And, of course, stay with EWTN News Nightly for many more very interesting stories in the months leading up to that summit. Up next, are you ready for some football with your wedding vows? Thank you for joining us for EWTN News Nightly. I'm Brian Patrick and an interesting twist to Thursday's referendum for Scottish independence from the United Kingdom. The stakes are high for the wedding industry at Gretna Green, a Scottish village across the border from England. For years, English couples have crossed over to the venues in this picturesque town to say, I do. It started as a way of getting around an old British law that banned marriage without parental consent for people under 21. Since the law wasn't enforced in Scotland, the town gained a reputation as a romantic wedding destination. But leaving the union could feel like breaking up for people on both sides of the border. If you, are, if you have some differences that you want to sort out, you don't file for divorce as the best way of achieving that. And, you know, we don't do divorce here at Gretna Green. It's not what we're famous for. We're famous for marriage. Houston says instead of divorcing, Scotland should be given more local control of its affairs. 4.2 million Scots are registered to vote on Thursday on whether to separate from the UK. England and Scotland tied the knot politically in 1707. Well, some brides planning their special day are keeping another day in mind, game day. Catherine Zeltner reports on couples bringing football flair to their weddings. It's a day all brides envision from an early age. The perfect dress, the perfect location, and the perfect date. So I'm getting married on June 20th this summer, and the reason why I chose that date was because it wasn't in the fall, so it wouldn't interfere with football season. It's nothing out of the ordinary for many young brides getting hitched in areas where football reigns supreme. While Emily Yonker would have liked a fall wedding, keeping her fiancé happy, a die-hard Bama fan like herself, is a compromise she's willing to make. To me, it's more worth it for me to be able to not have to miss a football weekend and enjoy my wedding and enjoy my football season. And in states like Alabama, getting married on a Saturday could mean for sparse attendance and lost money on leftover drinks and food. If the kickoff is at 2.30 and your wedding starts at 3.00, you're not going to have any guests, you know, or you're only going to have guests who are maybe over 55, you know, and mostly women. You know, the men are going to be at home, and if their wives drag them, they're going to have little earplugs in, watching little miniature televisions the whole time. While keeping with tradition for the nuptials, the football fanatics promised their guests full crimson tide pride. Whenever they send off the bride and the groom, um, we have shakers. Alabama Shakers and our initials and the date of the wedding are monogrammed up the side of the, the Shakers and uh, we're actually being sent away to the Alabama fight song. A wedding that's sure to score a touchdown with family and friends. Katherine Seltner, EWTN News Nightly. Roll Tide. We just have a few Alabama fans watching EWTN. Well, we thank you for watching tonight. Until tomorrow, we invite you to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, watch again anytime on EWTN's YouTube page. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick. Thank you for watching tonight and every night. Good night and may God bless you.